just want to welcome you. This uh, uh, has been a, a wonderful experience for us, and I think some of you have been here and heard this over and over about uh, kind of how this got started, but uh, on the far wall is uh, the group of photographs that uh, uh, Clara Rudell, uh, Bob Holmes, and I put together that then was adopted by the uh, Lakes Trail, the uh, uh, Texas Lakes Trail, one of the Texas Historical Commission, uh, you know, areas of the heritage tourism. And uh, so it has gone forward, and, and actually uh, Clara back there is who is counting on both fingers to, to how many people are here, but uh, it was her interest in photography that was one of the, the things that really got us uh, into this. You know, this is several years ago. And so it's uh, really kind of interesting to kind of look back and how did we get into this. And the other thing are people, uh, and Lance being one of those that uh, through the years we've gotten to know that uh, from the Comanche world and that have made us so interested in you know, learning more about that history. So I want to acknowledge our sponsors uh, here on the, the board, uh, but uh, we have really appreciated the fact that they had that interest, everything, you know, in terms of the mayor's promotional fund and, and uh, the, the Worthington Hotel, the library. The, in fact, the, the uh, Imagination Celebration uh, is the group that uh, works with us. And we will have brought through, in through the, really, the, the good offices of Imagination Celebration, 1,400 kids through this exhibit and two other kind of components of it, uh, researching a computer about uh, Quanah Parker and the uh, Comanche history, uh, as well as uh, another session with the, the woman uh, who runs, who has a program, or uh, runs the program in the uh, independent school district uh, for Comanche children, and or for you know, children of Indian background. So anyway, that's kind of the, uh, the background of uh, how we have gotten here. And also, I want to thank Bob Venable over here, the, uh, the one who is filming all of you, as we've said in the past, if you are wanted by Pinkerton or any of the other uh, law enforcement agencies, hide your face or put your, your face in a, in a bag or something. But uh, so, uh, but uh, we will have, in fact, all of these, all 13 sessions uh, that will have been filmed and recorded, which is a really a special thing. And the, the library will have a full set of those. Well, anyway, tonight, uh, I think we've all been looking forward to this. Uh, but in fact, none of this would be possible if it hadn't been for the help that Lance, Ben Tomacara, Jim Lane, uh, the uh, Applewhite, Clark Applewhite Collection uh, uh, provided us. Because one of the things that I think is so true, you can see things on a wall, pictures and images, but it's also seeing objects that it's so, so important. And I have here, you know, where did it go? Is it, is it, oh, it's back here. You're going to talk about the, well, actually, let me. Lance uh, <coughs> loaned from his family uh, some wonderful objects that are in, in as you come in the exhibit, and it's just uh, just stunning the, the beauty of them and the variety and and but this is a hoof stand for for horses, and it was too large to fit in any of those. And I just wanted to make sure that Lance knew that we hadn't run away with it. It still exists, uh, and and there it is. But. Uh, it is one of the other items from Lance and his family that, that did not get on display. But, you know, when you think about this was Quanah Parker's, and, and, I mean, it really gives you a tremendous feeling, you know, both that the history wasn't that long ago, and the history was very significant. Well, I'm going to turn this over to Bob Holmes, uh, and he was very important because we had to recruit a tall guy to put all the exhibits on the wall. And so he qualified for that. But he's, he is going to introduce uh, uh, Lance. Also, uh, my wife is here, so turn off your phones, everybody. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and, uh, but uh, Bob, please introduce Lance. Welcome, one and all. Uh, we're, I've got our speaker tonight is Lance Munro Tomacara. Most of uh, a lot of you know him personally, and uh, he's always been instrumental in uh, supporting our uh, projects. And uh, as Doug mentioned, the case in the uh, foyer there, as you come into the gallery, be sure and uh, look that over if you haven't already. And if you have, we'll look at it again because there's so many treasures in there that they've accumulated. It's really awe-inspiring. Lance was a uh, 
born in Fort Worth and uh, raised in Fort Worth, so uh, we'll uh, kind of mention uh, some of his items about his working career. He's uh, uh, an imaging manager for Texas Health, the Harris the Methodist Outpatient Center in Burleson, son of Monroe and Pat Tomacara. He was born and raised in Fort Worth. He is married to Debbie Tomacara, and they have a son, Lance Tomacara. Lane. Lance has been uh, with the Harris Hospital of Fort Worth uh, group for 36 years in the radiology and imaging department and currently manages their imaging department in Burleson. As a great, great grandson of Chief uh, Quanah Parker, much of his youth was spent on weekends with the family in powwows in Oklahoma and the Dallas-Fort Worth area. For him and his parents, these powwows were a way to for the family to stay connected with their Comanche traditions and spend time with family and friends. For the past 20 years or so, he's been asked to speak at various uh, venues like the uh, school children, scouts, and uh, any other organizations or groups that's interested in the Comanche people and Kwai and uh, his uh, mother, Cynthia Ann. He likes to share that with those, those stories and tidbits of information that are, uh, they grow over the years, like to be, he likes to share them with all. So we will, uh, without further ado, put our hands together for our speaker, Grant. Good deal. Thank you for coming out tonight. The Comanche word for thank you is adieu. Can you say adieu? Adieu. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my sister, where's she at, uh, Sister Karen, hiding. Um, if, if you want to add to any of this, great. Um, anyway, I just want to share with you some of the stories of the Comanche people. Uh, stories about my family, um, just storytelling was, was that was the end in way. Uh, we didn't have schools and the way that the elders taught their young was through storytelling. And I'd just like to share a few things, um, history, um, culture, et cetera with you. Um, my last name is Tomakara. Um, Tomakuru was the original phrase or the original word. Um, that was my uh, great great grandfather's name, and it got changed to Tomakara whenever the all the uh, Indians became U.S. citizens in uh, 1924. Uh, that's what the guy wrote down was Tomakara, so that's what we got. <laughs> um, I never know quite where to start. Um, the Comanche people, we just believe that we always existed. Um, it's pretty much agreed to that uh, we're a spinoff from the Shoshone tribe. Um, story that I'd read was that um, the Comanches, they wanted to pursue the horse as a means of travel. And Shoshones, they were more in the northern area, um, Wyoming area around that. And they stayed up there. The Comanches became nomadic. Now, the reason that we were so nomadic would be why. The bison? That's correct. <laughs> we hunted the buffalo. Um, we hunted other animals, but that was primarily our, our sustenance. And the tribes would spring, summer, into the fall. We really hunted hard because come winter time, we needed to find a place where we could settle down that was sheltered from the weather. And 
we would hunt these buffalo wherever they roamed. Uh, it was estimated that maybe, maybe there was 45 million buffalo out on the, out on the plains. I read those numbers. Before it was all said and done, and before it was all said and done, and Quanta was surrendering, there were maybe 1,500 out there on the plains. We had, we were starving, so we had to surrender. But um, the buffalo, we used everything on it. You know, the, the, the horns, the, the, the hide, the fur, the meat. And this last week, I went up to Oklahoma and visited with my Aunt Anna. And I'll, I'll refer to her quite often here. Aunt Anna, her original name was uh, Anna Wagnatua. Um, she was raised by Tope, Quanah Parker's wife. Her mother died when she was 10 months old. Um, when she was four, uh, Tope adopted her. And she lived there at the Star House. Not actually in it, there was another house next to it. But that's, uh, she was raised there. And she had a real insight uh, asking Tope about the Indian way of life. And uh, Anna told me that the buffalo, if you've ever wondered how we hunted in the summer, but yet we, we ate it in the winter, months later, why didn't it rot? Um, the way that you process buffalo meat was that you cut the meat really thin. You lay them across boards or, or, or posts and let the meat dry to a certain texture. And at that point, you would throw the meat on coals and let it cook. Once it cooked, they would take it off and they would pound it into a powder. Um, the, they would use lard, which they got from the traders that, that came through. Um, and Wes, you may appreciate this, but Wes does trees and the Comanches would look for trees with big knots on the side of them. And they would cut that knot off, hollow it out, and that'd be their bowl. And they would ground the meat with that. Um, anyway, Anna said that this meat never spoiled. They, they just had a way of preparing it. Same with uh, plums, whatever they picked, whatever was available, you know, they picked it and uh, they could eat it in the winter and they never starved. Um, but getting, getting away from that, this buffalo, you know, what's so special about this buffalo? It, just looking at him. He's got this hump on his back. Um, I'm going to tell you various stories, and again, it's a way to teach the young on how to live their life. Um, this is a story that my uncle Benjamin Tomacara told me when I was a little kid, and uh, he, never, he never spoke English. I never heard him speak English unless he was, I was on his lap and he was telling me a story. Uh, growing up, when we went to visit family, they only spoke Comanche, and we never understood anything they were saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Am I right, Karen? Yeah. We never understood it. But he told me this story. These stories always have morals to them. And uh, look for the moral. But, uh, you know, when the Great Spirit created all the, all the animals on the plains, the, the animals that he, that he put on the land and the birds he put in the, in the sky, uh, the fish that he put in the waters, you know, he realized that he needed one animal that could, that could care for all the rest of them and keep peace out on the plains. And um, so he took his fastest, his largest, his strongest animal, which was the buffalo. And at the time, this buffalo did not have that hump on his back. He was a very tall animal, and he could see far away. Uh, fast, he was strong. And he said, Buffalo, 
I want you to take, to take care of my, my creatures. That's all I want you to do. And the buffalo, buffalo said, okay. So for a long time, there was peace on the plains and everybody got along. But as time went on, this buffalo started to think that maybe he was a little bit better than all the other animals. He was superior to them. And he began to neglect them. And as time went on, um, he, he didn't like the other animals. He started to think that this was, these were his planes. Um, they didn't belong on his planes. And it finally got to the point where the buffalo, um, he literally would start running the other animals off the planes. And one day he's going across a meadow and he sees up on a ridge a, a wolf. And he thinks, that wolf is on my planes. He's got to go. I don't want him here. So he charged at the, at the wolf. And as he's charging, he didn't see the bird's nest that had fallen from the tree was on the ground. He trampled this nest. And the great spirit just couldn't take any more. He came down and said, Buffalo, what have you done? You know, I made you the strongest, the fastest, the biggest of all my creatures. And all I ask you to do is care for them. So from now on, I'm putting this hump on your back. Your head will always face the ground, and you'll always look for those bird's nests. So that's how the buffalo got his hump. Um, I've got kind of a timeline here. Um, I'll try to follow it some. Um, I've got other stories like that that are, uh, to me, more interesting. But um, in 19, 19, or 1830, Andrew Jackson signed the, uh, the Indian Removal Act. That basically gave him the authority to make treaties with the tribes, the southern tribes, to move them off the, the south part of America. Um, United States and okay well he was able to do that but 1834 came around and somebody realized well what are we going to do with these people when we move them out of Alabama and Georgia what are we going to do with them they established the Oklahoma Indian Territory and you know the five civilized tribes the Choctaws Cherokees um, they had to go and uh, they got pushed to Oklahoma um, move ahead a couple of years, and let's talk about 1836. What happened um, the last week of February, first week of March of 1836? Who can tell me what happened then? The Alamo. The Alamo. Things are related here. Um, what happened the next month? San Jacinto. What happened the next month? Now we're talking about Cynthia Ann. Um, these, these three great events happened within two months of each other. And Comanches, other tribes, they raided Fort, Fort Parker and they took, um, what was it, five captives? Miss Plummer, Miss Kellogg, uh, John Plummer, or James Plummer, I guess, um, Cynthia Ann and her brother John. Cynthia Ann was nine years old at the time, and John, her, her brother, was six. Uh, why would they take these people? Any idea? Now, see, I'm used to talking to these little five, you know, fifth graders. <laughs> you guys are usually just jumping right in. Price, price. Pardon me? Price, price. That's right. That was one of the reasons was you could treat these people like they were money, they were commodities. You could trade them for whatever goods that you wanted. Another reason was it simply helped replenish our tribe. You know, we had diseases and people died at early ages and you had to replenish your tribe, you know, otherwise it dies. Cynthia Ann was raised um, with the Comanche tribe. Um, Miss Kellogg, Miss Plummer, eventually uh, were ransomed back. Um, I'm not sure what happened to James Parker, um, 
John, uh, uh, not, not James Parker, um, James Plummer, John Parker, his story is almost as interesting as Cynthia Ann. In some ways, it's more interesting. Um, six years old, he's taken off, and he's raised as a Comanche. And he lived with them for probably nine years, maybe. And for whatever reason, they raised him back. Um, and he went to go live with the white man again. And he didn't like it. He goes back to the Comanches. And, you know, so he's, he's going both ways here. And what happens about 1860, the Civil War? Well, Texas, you know, he wants to join the, the, the Texas Confederacy. He goes and fights in the Civil War. After that, he comes back and uh, uh, lives out his life in Mexico. Um, there's a story in there when he, the first time he went back, um, he, uh, he was out on a raiding party. He got a sickness and the people that he was with, you know, they had taken a Mexican woman captive. They're coming back and he got sick. Well, they didn't want to get sick, so they left him. And they made this Mexican woman stay with him and told, told her to nurse him back to health. She did, and they married. And that's who he, that's who, uh, he spent the you know, rest of his days with in Mexico with. But his story is just as fantastic as hers. Indian children, when there were raids, et cetera, they were taken, and they were raised as whites. And quite often, they didn't want to go back to the Indian ways. It was a two-way street here. Um, Cynthia Ann, she was raised as a Comanche. Um, my Aunt Anna told me, um, she was talking with Tope one day, and she says, Tope, did, did the Indians really accept her, knowing that she was white, she had blonde hair? Um, uh, the, the preparation of the, the buffalo meat, did she participate in that? Did she, was she more aloof? And Tope said she was Indian. She did everything that all the other women did. Um, if, if it was unpleasant, whatever, she did it. She, whatever needed to be done, she did it. She was a, she was a total Indian by then. Her recapture at the Peace River, coming back here to Fort Worth, that was against everything that she wanted. Um, story I was told was that she was brought back to Fort Worth and there was a department store somewhere here downtown. She was put on a soapbox, and people were charged a nickel to come see the white woman that lived as a Comanche and was returned. Um, she, Isaac Parker, took her in, and this last week was the uh, uh, presentation, or, or week before, on uh, the Parker cabin. Um, she had to live there for a period of, I don't remember if it was two years or 12 months, whatever, but she ended up in East Texas. Um, and I think she, she passed away at, what, 1870? Um, but she was heartbroken. She wanted to be back with her people. Um, Let's, let's talk about Cynthia's robe. When she was captured at the Peace River, supposedly there was a robe that she had around her. And Saul Ross took this robe and kept it. Um, the Fort Worth uh, Museum of Science and History, uh, it was donated, uh, the, the people that had it, they donated it to to the Fort Worth Museum, and since, I think it was in 74 maybe, um, but 
that supposedly was the robe that she was wearing. Um, friend of a friend, uh, wife's director, she got us in to see this robe. And it was in a warehouse there off Montgomery Street. Um, Tom, uh, Tom Saunders, rancher there in Parker County. Uh, she's the director, or was a director there at uh, the museum. My sister Karen on the far right, and uh, you know the bear's saying something to her in her ear. I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> but, uh, our next slide. But it's a beautiful robe. There's a picture out of it out there in the area. Take a look at it. But if you want to see it up close and personal, go to Lawton, Oklahoma. The Comanche tribe has its own museum. And the Fort Worth Museum loaned it to them for this next year. And it'll be there till probably next December. The deal was that if the tribe built a case um, that would protect the robe, they would ship it up there. And then whenever it's time for it to come back, the case comes with the robe. But uh, the fur, of course, is on the bottom side. Um, you know, just imagine, did Nakona do that painting? Who knows? The um, thing about Comanches is we never wrote anything down. We read articles, we read books. Um, there's so much literature out there. The tribe never even had a, an agreed to written language until 1995. We never wrote anything down. And uh, let's go to our next slide if we could. That would be the center. And I assume that's the sun maybe, but uh, the depiction. But uh, the, uh, the slide doesn't do this justice. Uh, it really is a beautiful robe. Our next one. And then one corner. I don't know what the symbols mean, but I know that they did have some sort of meaning to them. Um, Comanches, uh, the paintings, beadwork, we bead in ge geometrical angles. Um, you can almost tell a tribe by their beadwork and uh, their art. It's, uh, it's angles, it's lines. Uh, let's see. What slide is that? Seven, let's see number eight. And then uh, I think that's the, uh, the top of the road there. Anyway, it, it's up there in Lawton. All you gotta do is go up there and have a look. And there, if you wanna know about Comanches, man, that's where they're all at. There's about 15, little over 15,000 of us. And half of them live in the Fort Sill, Lawton, Walters cash area um, but the, the really neat museum and some of the art some of the things hanging on the wall the museum donated down here uh, kind of the history on the, that back wall over there um, moving on a little bit here um, this let's go to our next slide Is that it? Did we go to nine? Eight, nine? Okay, well let's go to nine then. Okay, the, the Comanches, like I said, there were millions and millions of buffalo. And as the buffalo hunters killed off the buffalo, our source of food went away. More and more tribes were, were having to relocate um, let's go back to nine. Okay. All right. Um, more and more tribes were having to go to Oklahoma Territory. That's the reservation. Um, in 1867, there was a meeting at, um, Medicine Lodge. Uh, there was a series of three different uh, treaties signed in a short period of time. And it 
there were like two dozen, for the Comanche tribes, there was like two dozen signatures of, of various bands surrendering and agreeing to go to the reservation. What that meant was that the tribe would stop warring, stop raiding. Um, they would go live on, on this area. Um, down here would be somewhere around uh, Vernon, Texas. This would be like Elk City. And this is Chickasha. Uh, Norman, Oklahoma would be up in here. Uh, this would be down in Gainesville. Um, it was a three million acre reservation. Um, but when you compare it to the size of the land that we roamed, that we were free on, it's just a drop in the bucket. But it is a beautiful place up there. If you ever get a chance to go see that area, it's rolling hills. It's uh, the Wichita Mountains are up there. Uh, it's just it's a great place to spend a day driving around. But the treaty itself, the Comanches had to go live on this reservation. Um, in return, well, they had to also allow for uh, a railroad to be built across the, the reservation so that they could transport people and cattle. Um, in return, the buffalo hunters were not allowed in this area. Um, the government would give annuities, uh, money to buy things. Uh, they'd give them rations. They would provide uh, a hospital. They would provide schools. Um, they would they would do what they needed to do to get the Americans or get the the, the Indians, the Comanches, Americanized. I think was the term. Um, now they understood that. Um, the older Indians, the ones that, that fought, that hunted, they just couldn't change their lifestyle. Um, they were set in their ways. And the deal about schools was, if you really want to change a generation, you start with the little people that are just learning and teach them what you want them to know. And uh, there was a uh, Fort Sill Indian School opened in uh, 1871. Um, 36 was 19, or 1836 was a big year because of the Alamo, the San Jacinto, sent the end. 1871 to me was just as big. Uh, two things happened. Uh, the Fort Sale Indian School opened. I think there were six pupils, four of them were Comanche. But also two, um, they had, we had signed this treaty in 1867. We were given a couple of years to move on to the reservation. We were two years into this reservation life and the government was not holding up its end of the bargain. Um, the annuities weren't coming, the rations weren't coming, the beef was bad that they were giving us, et cetera. Um, and the older Indians they left the reservation. They went out raiding. They went back to their old ways of we're going to go, if you're not going to give us our food, we're going to go take it. Um, Fort Richardson, do y'all know where that's at? Going up Jacksboro? Jacksboro. 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 Yeah. It's what, about 40, 40 miles northwest of us between here and Wichita Falls? Um, Sand Tank, Santana. Big tree. They were Kiowa chiefs. Um, this whole reservation was the Kiowa, Comanche, Apache reservation. Three different tribes and their various bands living here. Um, but those three chiefs, they led a raiding party out of there. And they went south. And they went to food, they went to get, get horses, they went to get whatever supplies they could because, you know, they just weren't being taken care of like they should have. And the story goes that. Um, um, General Sherman was visiting the various 
uh, forts in the area. He uh, he was going through there near near that uh, um, uh, area, uh, and the Comanche saw him, but they let him pass. It was he was just a small group. He didn't have anything of value to him, and they knew that there was a wagon train. The Warren wagon train was coming through after there, and they let him pass. But they attacked that Warren wagon train, and they killed several of the mule drivers. Um, took their took their mules, took their food, and they took it back up there onto the reservation. It was a uh, it was life as usual for for an Indian. I mean, that's just. That's just what we did. Um, if we wanted something, we took it. Um, but um, the general didn't see it like that. They went back up there, and Santana was talking to the agency man and was bragging about this. You know, it's just, we had nothing to hide. We were going back to our old ways. And the agent, uh, he got word down to Sherman and went up there and arrested those three chiefs. This was a big moment in that when he arrested them, up until that point, it was the Indian Wars. We were, we were prisoners of war if we were ever captured. But when they were, were brought back to uh, Fort Richardson to stand trial, they were treated as criminals. Um, Sand Tank, um, the story goes, that, you know, the three of them are in these wagons, they're headed south, and Sand Tank um, began singing his death song, and he covered his head with a, a blanket and gnawed through his, his ropes that were binding him and managed to uh, to stab one of the one of the, the guards that were taking him back, tried to escape, they shot and killed him. They left him on the side of the road. Santana and Big Tree, they went back to Fort Richardson and they stood trial um, for murder and found guilty, sentenced to life imprisonment. We're gonna be taken down to Huntsville. Um, and they ended up staying there a couple of years. This really made the Indians mad, and they were ready to leave the reservation. The governor of Texas, after a couple of years, he pardoned, pardoned them. If they would go back, not stop their raiding, go back to these old rules, they could go back and live on the reservation. Uh, further down the road, uh, Santana was at uh, uh, Adobe Walls, the second battle. Uh, they found out about it, and he got rearrested and he was sent back to Huntsville. Big Tree, I believe, became a minister. Um, and if, if you, y'all have you've all watched Lonesome Dove, right? Blue Duck, I mean, that's, you know, he's the bad guy. Well, Santana in that movie was, was Blue Duck. And yes, he did jump out of a window and he killed himself. Um, he just could not see living the rest of his life in bars or behind bars. Um, and something about the, um, uh, oh, the movie that you may be interested in, the Sobos. Did, were, you, were some of y'all here at that Saturday when we got together and the tribe came down and, they, and whatnot? Okay, well the Sobos, one was a, the lead singer there. Um, they got parts in that movie, Lonesome Dove, and they're twins. You can't hardly tell them apart. One of them got the part, and the next morning that they were having the shoot, he overslept, the other one got up, <laughs> and he was in the movie. Yeah. It, anyway, I'm rambling. Um, Anyway, that's, for us, we, we were no longer treated as prisoners of war, 
as, as a, a, you know, the north-south kind of a thing, we were treated as criminals for anything we did after that point. Uh, the Medicine Lodge Treaty, up until that point, um, the government made treaties with various tribes, and those tribes moved onto the reservation. The Medicine Lodge Treaty was the last, if not one of the last, uh, times that was ever done. Um, from then on, Congress made laws, and there was no more treaties with any more tribes. It was all laws after that, on a bigger scale. Um, again, we're into this Americanization process. Um, what else we got here? We'll lighten the mood here. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. So that's the fourth, that, I'm not sure that that's Fort Seal, but that's Quanta there in the middle um, at an Indian boarding school. Um, the only person smiling is the teacher. Uh, there is no telling what they did to get in trouble, but uh, you could definitely tell that they were in big trouble for whatever it was. Uh, let's go to our next one. There we go. Um, when I give these talks, it's usually a show and tell with the, with the kids. And um, we're going to have a show and tell, if that's OK with y'all. That would be a wolf. And obviously, there's a disagreement over who's going to have the carcass at the bottom. Um, I'd bet on the eagle. It's a golden eagle. You can tell by its feathers. Um, this, if they don't fall. These would be golden eagle feathers. And again, it's show and tell. If y'all will uh, just pass that around. Um, being tribal, I'm allowed to have them. Um, and I just want to share them with you. Uh, I've been sharing these feathers for years and years and years with kids. I've, they've always come back to me. I don't worry about them, but they are old. Um, if you notice, those, the golden eagles, there's the white on the bottom. As the eagle matures, the feather becomes less and less white. Um, this would be a bald eagle. They're, they're a more solid black. Now, this story I'm going to tell you, it's not a Comanche story, uh, but it's, again, it's, it's the elders trying to teach their young. And there's a tribe out in, uh, out in uh, California that when their young people become of age, uh, they tell them the story of, of the mating of eagles. The female eagle, when she, when she matures enough, um, she will try to go out and find a suitor. And a male eagle would fly with her, and they would match up, and they would just fly along together. And if, and if, they, if they flew well and she liked him, she would go down to the ground and pick up a stick and they would fly way up high, and she'd drop that stick. And the male eagle, by instinct, would literally dive down and grab that stick. And if he did, great. They'd fly along some more. She'd pick up another stick a little bit bigger next time. And it literally gets to the point where she's picking up a small log. And they're flying up, and she drops this log. If the male eagle fails anywhere along this line, 
to, to grab that log, she flies off in another direction and she goes to find another suitor. They mate for life. They, they you know, they, that's just the way of the eagles. Um, now, why in the world would she be doing that? Well, who's got an idea why they would do that? Okay, well, let's go to our next slide. A couple of bald eagles. Um, you see the two eaglets. You know, sometimes when it's time for them to leave their nest and try to fly on their own, they don't always make it. That's his job is to be there and get him before he hits the ground. It's the moral of the story. Y'all tell me what the moral of the story is. Okay. Um, these are elders teaching their young this story. They're telling them this story. If you're the female eagle, how well do you make your decisions? Is it just a popular decision that you make with the crowd? Um, are you willing, if, if you're with somebody that's not right, are you willing to go away? The male eagle, are you always willing to be there for him? It's a, it's a story from, from a tribe in California. Um, it's an Indian story. Thought you might like it. Um, more show and tell. We got more show and tell. Oh, oh, before I get off the subject. I'm not going to pass this feather around. Would y'all agree that that's a beautiful feather? Karen, whose feather is this? It's your feather. When my, when my sister Karen got her Indian name, uh, would you watch a taker, George, would you watch a taker? Um, only, only medicine man I knew. Um, there was a ceremony at a powwow, and he gave her her name, Nawasia, which is beautiful feather. That's, that's her feather. Now these photos here, if y'all were here um, last week on how to read a photo, this is what she was talking about. You know, and again, I give these talks to these little kids and these pictures always come back. They don't tear them up. Um, <laughs> this first one is, that's Quanta Parker. And, This lady here, I believe she was a Kiowa. Comanche mother and her children. Another Comanche in a buckskin dress. These two gentlemen, am I, am I stand in the wrong spot? The gentleman sitting down my great-grandfather's name was Tomakara. He just had one name. This is her, his brother that's sitting down here. And this photo here, I know y'all can't see it from way back there, but I'm, hopefully it'll get, back, get up there to you. Um, you know, what do you, you, you yell when you jump out of an airplane? I've got so many stories, I can just go in different directions here. Um, let's talk a little, little bit more about the uh, Fort Sale Indian School. 
it was opened in 1871. It wasn't a, a school like we know. Uh, when you went there, you went and you lived there. Um, the, like I said, half a dozen students, four of them were Comanches. Um, if, well, when they went there, it was run by Mormons, uh, missionaries. Um, or, I'm sorry, Quaker, not Mormon, Quakers. And it was, it was a nice school. There was two things, two agendas here. Was that we want to teach you a trade. If you're a girl, you knew how to sew, cook, etc. If you were a boy, you know, you would learn how to farm or you would learn how to, uh, to make things. Um, it was a trade school kind of a thing. Half your day was spent learning uh, English, math, and then the other half was spent, you know, out in the fields or in a shop or something like that, or um, learning how to cook, how to sew. They were teaching these little children how to be a, Americans. Um, we were considered wards of the state. We weren't U.S. citizens. Um, they were trying to teach us the American way. They wanted us to be like them. Before, um, the tribe raised the child. Um, the, the, the whole community saw to the, that child's well-being and taught them lessons. The American way became more of a, a home family lifestyle. They were trying to make this switch from the old ways to the new ways. Um, I read a, a small book that was written by several interviews with people that, with the elders that went to this Fort Sill Indian School. And initially, they were afraid, it was a two-story building, they were afraid to, to go up on the second floor, so they were allowed to sleep in teepees in the front yard. Um, they just couldn't quite make that adapt adaptation there. Um, you know, imagine you, the parent, turning loose of your six-year-old to go live somewhere for four or six months. And if it was far away and you had to, had to do what you needed to do to survive, how often did you get up there to see that child? Um, Karen and my dad, he went there. He went to the Forest Hill Indian School. And when he came home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, he told his parents he had, he had learned a foreign language called English. <laughs> True story. Um, but it got to the point where parents were proud that their children did go to the school. Because, I mean, the, the writing's on the wall. We're not going to roam the plains. We're not going to hunt the buffalo anymore. There's got to be a change. And they were proud that their child was learning how to survive as they got older. Um, 71 is when it opened in, I believe, 1879. Um, they moved the school to Anadarko. If you know anything about the area, that's about 40 to 50 miles to the north of Lawton. Okay, well, you're the parent, and they're going to move your child another 50 miles away. You know, they didn't like that. And the government made them send their children. It did not matter. Uh, it was the, uh, the Indian Agency moved to Anadarko, therefore the school moved. And it was up there, uh, I believe, uh, 1890 is when it finally moved back to, to uh, Fort Sill and the Lawton area. Um, but during that time, if a family did not send their child to the boarding school, their annuities, their rations, the food, whatever was distributed, part of this deal was withheld from them. So they were just, they were like captives. They had to give their children up um, to be that far away from them. Um, stepping back a little bit, 1871, Fort Sill opened. So did Carlisle um, 
up in Pennsylvania. Y'all have heard of that school up there. Jim Thorpe went to it. Um, Quanta Parker sent, I want to say he sent three children initially up there to, to the, uh, the school. And uh, interesting story, when we were visiting with Anna Anna this last week, she, you know, she was walking through the exhibit here. And there's a picture in the far corner of uh, Quanta, portrait of his family and Derek Carlisle. And Anna said that uh, one of his daughters, you know, he, he, he takes the children up there, he goes back down to, to a cash lot and area where he lives, and it wasn't no time, and one of his daughters was back at the house. She didn't speak English, she didn't have any money. I mean, how in the world did she get back down there? So, you know, Quanta, I mean, he's no dummy. He started asking around, you know, how did she get back down here? And Quanta, he had a bunch of cowboys working for him, if you didn't know that. But they ranched, they cooked, they took care of the place. Um, he started asking around, they said, go ask the cowboys. So he goes and he asks the cowboys and nobody, they're all afraid of him. And nobody would tell him. But finally one of them spoke up and they said, you should go talk to this, this fellow. He probably knows. He goes and talks to this other cowboy and the cowboy says, well, she's kind of sweet on James Cox. Okay, well, Quanta, he wants to talk to James Cox, James Cox next. And it wasn't any time that uh, she became Mrs. James Cox. No. So, <laughs> but that's a story that Aunt Anna told me, you know, out there in the foyer. Yeah. Um, Fort Sale Indian School, it was a, a success. Uh, it opened in 1871. It closed in 1988. Do the math. It was a success. Um, Carlisle was not so much a success. It was only open maybe 20, 25 years before it closed. Um, the Medicine Lodge Treaty, it wasn't one of those treaties that we've always heard about where as long as the wind blows and the water flows and you know, the grass grows kind of thing. It had an expiration date on it, 30 years. 1867, do the math, we're getting here at the turn of the century. Oklahoma is about to become a, a, uh, a state. And everything was coming together here, these changes. You've got all these Indians on that map there, living in that three million acres. Um, the, the Dawes Act was passed, which basically said a man that's married will get 160 acres and they, they'll have that land to, to ranch or farm on. If you were single, you only got 80. But the writing's on the wall that the, even the reservation was going away. This, uh, this treaty wasn't gonna go forever. And uh, a little bit further down the line, uh, the, the uh, Jerome Agreement, which was specific to the Kiowa Comanche Apache Reservation, was that um, uh, we, would, we would take that 160 acres. And that's probably about 10, the, the number of tribal members that got land if you add that all up, we lost about 90% of the reservation. Um, the Dawes Act, it, it allowed for the survey of the land um, so that they knew that they were gonna start dividing this stuff up uh, and it allowed for census to be taken. We wanna know who's on the rolls when it is time to, to divide the land. Um, so that's kinda how it got. The, the reservation went away. There are no reservations in Oklahoma. They, they just don't exist anymore. Um, moving forward, Oklahoma becomes a state in 1907. Uh, 1911, um, Quanta dies. And 
story that maybe you're not aware of was that four years, about four years after he had been buried in Post Oak Cemetery, which is, uh, you got Lawton, Cash, Indiahoma, and a little bit to the northwest is, uh, was the Post Oak Cemetery. He was buried there. Um, about four years after that, uh, robbers came in and, and uh, desecrated his grave. Uh, if you've seen pictures out there, you know, Quanta had a pendant that he always had. Um, he had rings, et cetera, and they, they dug up his grave, sp scattered his bones, and took what they could get. Don't know who did it. I don't think it's ever been found out. Um, one story says that they got all that valuable things. Another story was that, you know, Quanta did not have all that jewelry and whatnot buried in there with him. But who knows? Just the fact that somebody went in there to desecrate his grave to take what they could. You know, it's just, it's awful. Um, after that, um, Quanta, his Cynthia Ann, he, Quanta had, when he was still alive, arranged for Cynthia Ann to be brought back down and buried. And he was actually buried next to her uh, there at Post Oak Cemetery. They were moved to Fort Seal on uh, Chief Snow, what's called Chief Snow. And if you ever get a chance, go to Fort Seal and see that. Uh, just the fort itself really is a neat historical, gives you an idea of really what was going on there. Um, but Geronimo was buried there, Quana, and the various chiefs, uh, Comanche, Kiowa chiefs, uh, are all buried there. Uh, neat little cemetery there on the post. Um, I know we got lots more slides here. Um, let's tell a story. How's that? Um, we've all seen a bat, right? We know what a bat looks like. How did the bat come to be? And again, now remember these are children's stories. There's a moral to it. The story goes when the, when the Great Spirit put all the animals out on the plains, um, you know, there was peace, there was, there was, everything was just right. Um, the sun would come up in the east and it would come up into the sky and it would give us light so that we could see, you know, the animals could see. It gave them warmth, it helped the grass grow. Um, and everything was just, it, it was the way it should be. But one morning, the sun was coming up on the horizon, and the sun got stuck in a giant tree. And the more the sun tried to get out of the tree, the more the limbs covered it up. And it got to the point where this tree, it blocked all the warmth, it blocked all the light. And For, for a period of time, nobody noticed, none of the animals noticed. But give it a couple of days, somebody, you know, they're asking amongst themselves, we have no warmth, we have no light, what's going on here? So a council was called of all the animals, all the plains animals. And they got together and they, they all agreed something's wrong. You know, the sun should have been in the sky. It's, it's not up there for us to give us warmth and light. And they said, well, maybe somebody needs to go check on the sun. And so you got all the big animals and the fast animals, you know, who's gonna step forward and go, uh, go check on the sun? And they were all afraid they wouldn't do it. But one of the smallest creatures, a squirrel stepped forward and he said, I'll go check on the sun. So off he goes, he, you know, to the east. And he traveled and he traveled and he traveled and he got so tired, I mean, it was a long, long way for such a small animal but he knew the other animals were dependent on him. He kept going. And finally he came up to this big tree and he could, he could see that the sun was in there with all the limbs covering him up. The sun saw the squirrel and he says, please, Mr. Squirrel, get me out of this tree. You know, all the plains animals, everything, they, they're depending on me. And uh, man, that squirrel just shot up that tree and started gnawing on the limbs. And the more limbs that he gnawed off, the more light there was. And the squirrel finally said, Mr. Son, I've got to stop. 
I said, your light's blinding me. Um, I can't see. And the son said, you're doing so well. I'll be out of here soon. Please keep going. So the squirrel kept you know, gnawing on the limbs. But as more time went on, more limbs fell to the ground. The heat from the, the sun was burning the squirrel. It was burning his fur off. It was burning his tail off. And the squirrel said, I've got to stop. I can't go any further. I said, your heat is, is burning me. You know, it's, it's turning my skin to just this black leather. And uh, the sun said, I'm almost free, just a little more. And sure enough, he nods some more. And the sun burst up in the sky. And there was warmth on the plains, and there was light, and everything was back to where it should be. Um, <clears throat> the son was so happy. And he looked back to give thanks to the squirrel, and he saw what had been sacrificed. Um, the squirrel said, you know, what of me? I have no fur, I have no tail, I'm blind. And the son said, you know, for what you've done, I will grant any wish you want. And the, the, the squirrel said, I've always wanted to fly. So the, the son said, okay, I'll give you wings and I'll make it so you don't, have, you don't have to see, you can fly at night. So that's how the bat came to be. There's a, how am I doing on time? I'm just rambling here. Okay, I'll wrap it up pretty soon here then. Um, a story my dad used to like to tell was a possum. We've all seen a possum, right, with the beautiful bushy tail? No. You know, it's the ugliest tail that, that there is. All right. One day, there's the possum with this beautiful bushy tail, and he used to have a be beautiful bushy tail, uh, was down at a, at a pond, and he would just dig down a little bit, and he would pull up an onion, and eat this onion, and um, oh, he was just, he just, he was in hog heaven, just loved it. And he looked across the pond, and there was this badger, you know, bigger animal, a little bit longer arms, and the badger dug down a little deeper than he did and pulled up a, an onion, a serious one. And the possum gets to thinking, you know, if I get really, really deep, I will get a big onion, and I won't have to do all this digging. I can just eat for a week on this thing. So. He starts digging, and his short little arms, he can only go down so far. And he's thinking, how can I get down deeper? And he says, I've got this tail. So he spins around with that tail. He's digging out a deeper, deeper hole, and darn if he doesn't get his tail stuck in the hole. <laughs> he's stuck. He's there all afternoon long, all night long. He cannot get out of this hole. This, this tail is just stuck. And the next morning, you know, when he finally got his tail out, all his fur was gone. So that's why the possum doesn't have any hair on his tail. <laughs> What's the moral of that story? You got it. Uh, I'll tell you one more last story, um, and it's a short one. My, my dad loved to tell this story, um, but it was uh, the turtle. We've all seen a turtle. The design on his back, kind of a, you know, almost a, a puzzle look on it. Um, one day an, an, an old woman um, was grinding corn and a turtle came up to her and was just staring at her and the, uh, the turtle, um, you know, she said, you know, go away turtle, you bother me, I'm grinding corn and he wouldn't leave and he just kept staring at her and she kept telling him to go away, go away and he wouldn't go. Finally, she grabbed the turtle, put him in the, and she ground him up. And that's how the turtle got his design on his back. <laughs> I never quite understood that moral other than just, <laughs> don't mess with your grandmother when she's cooking, I guess. I, I'm not sure. Um, um, anyway, uh, I, I could literally just, I could tell you these stories all night. Uh, I do appreciate your time. Uh, I know we're getting close to. Yeah. Would you want to take some time on questions? Uh, uh, yes, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Corner, you tell the corner, 
Um, it was after he surrendered. Um, I read a book that was written in 1938, and he had asked the agency man um, about his mother, and the agency man said, you need to go here to wherever, and uh, this Parker lives over there. He says, I'll write you a letter where you can go, and he went and visited with them, and somewhere along the lines he took, took that name. How true that story is, I don't know. The lady that wrote this book in 37, published in 38, her husband was a lawman on the frontier and uh, with Wyatt Earp, and he was a Oklahoma frontier lawman. But um, the book that she wrote, Wyatt Parker, which was one of Quanah's sons, was able to edit this book, and uh, so maybe that's where it came from. Um, it was like 20 years, 20 some years. Yeah, I'll wait a minute here. Okay, Carlisle. Carlisle opened in 1879. It closed in 1918. Uh, yeah, is there, we've seen a lot of pictures of Carlisle. Is there a picture that you ever smiled? <laughs> I've never seen one. Have you ever seen an Indian smile on a photo? I mean, really. Is there a family association? And how many descendants are there? And are there, aren't there white Parker family and yes. Indian Parker family? Do you relate to each other? I want to say in the 30s is whenever they started the, uh, the Parker reunion, an annual event at Fort Parker. Um, there's one every year down there in Cache, Oklahoma. There's one. They used to alternate for a while there, and I'm pretty sure that that, that in Cache it's an annual, in uh, Fort Parker it's an annual. But yes, they do get together. There is a bowl that they pass amongst each other each year. Fragrance. Why don't we, Leach sometimes talk individually with, with Lance at the end, but I think uh, this is so impressive because, and, uh, and I know that you'll be frisk as you leave, so that you get all the pictures and, the, and the everything back. Now, but, yes, go ahead. Before we get out of here, you know, part of, the, part of the Indian culture, part of our traditions is when you've been honored, you give gifts. You know, and I'm honored that y'all are here. I'm honored that you have put this display for us to come see and uh, stories to come hear. Thank you for that. And, you know, I've got these beaded belt buckles. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. Clara? Clara, come down, Clara. You know, one of the things taking the school children through, showing them the beaded items, it, it, it's, it's, and, and, and the images, it's just, it's wonderful. So thank you very much. Pendleton blankets, they're the best. They'll last forever. But, uh, Thank you for your time. Um, I wish I could just go more, but here we go.